All right, welcome everyone. We've hit the 1230 mark. Uh, hopefully more per, um, audience members will be joining us shortly. Uh, my name is Barbara Rodriguez and I will be your moderator. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to the panel on leveraging extended reality to improve operational effectiveness. This just a note, we've broadened the scope of the title to XR as an umbrella category that includes mixed reality, augmented reality, and virtual reality. Um, please let me to, allow me to introduce our uh, panelists. We've got Konstantin Shishkin from Spiral Technology, Russ Baker from Avalon Holographics, and Jason Gerald from NextGen Interactions. And gentlemen, I would like to start out by asking each of you, what is one of the best use cases of extended reality in base operations and defense in general that you have seen? Constantine, would you like to go first? Sure, very good question. And I would start saying that the, the first thing which our end users are caring about besides safety, of course, which is non-negotiable, uh, is mission capable rates. So the, the use cases which we are focusing for for the Air Force uh, related to increasing uh, efficiency of the repair and decreasing number of errors. And obviously it's a very broad category. One very specific example, which I can give, uh, we, are, we are in touch with a couple of uh, Air Force bases and one story uh, coming from one master surgeon uh, in charge of maintenance were very simple. They had a big job uh, on C-17, which was spanning several days and the night crew didn't have overlap with, with the next day crew. Uh, and uh, the, the maintainers showed up in the morning and some of the procedures were not properly documented. Like even like two out of 15 were missing. And basically what they had to do is completely redo the whole, the whole work, uh, wasting about 12 man hours of, of work. And nothing can be done in this case because again, safety is non-negotiable and you cannot assume that something was done properly. So in summary, what augmented reality, specifically the technology which uh, I'm the most knowledgeable about, allows to do for maintenance is to create a seamless digital workflow. And uh, important is that it can be hands-free delivered through the augmented reality headset. Leveraging still the same data which they have in their ERP systems and uh, maintenance uh, record systems, but having it like seamlessly displayed in, in front of their eyes when they're working and leaving all comprehensive notes. So this case would never happen with wasting time with this particular job and it's happening all across uh, the Air Force bases, of course, and Navy and, uh, and Army, uh, if you have everything fully documented and uh, we'll, we'll expand more on how, you, uh, how much deeper you can use these technologies for quality assurance and beyond. And all this will help definitely increase mission capable rates. I think this is uh, the, one of the most powerful use cases which I've seen so far. Thank you. Uh, Russ? Yeah, so I, I'm going to focus a little differently because uh, our technology is actually a little more into the future as opposed to the existing AR and VR applications. Where we've seen the most interest in holographic displays is on uh, battle space visualization. So specifically, both operationally and in training, um, visualizing all the data, the fused data that's been gathered by all the sensors and all the uh, information that's out there, whether that's in the... Uh, forward operating uh, battle space, or that could also apply to a digital twin of the base itself. Um, turning all that information into a single visual space where you can very intuitively judge all the spatial relationships and understand where everything is relative to everything else um, has been a very strong focus area. And it really becomes the most valuable or the most compelling when you have a uh, fast and high consequence decisions to be made. Um, where you don't have a, a lot of time to analyze, you kind of have to make choices and judgments very, very quickly. That's where we've seen the most in, impact and interest. Uh, we've seen interest and, and work being done with VR and AR today, and we're just seeing a lot of pull through to do that in a more natural way on light field displays. That's, that's the one that's come up the most often for us. Thank you. And, and Jason, um, do you have a best use case or, or have you noticed interest in any particular area? Yeah, what we've uh, gotten feedback from our subject matter experts and what we really decided to focus on is, uh, is high risk, low frequency incidents. Specifically, we're looking at public safety, but you know, those really dangerous parts of public safety, but not necessarily you know, something that's dangerous, but you deal with it every day because it might be really risky, but you might be really good at dealing with those risks if you're doing it constantly. But if you're only you know, uh, you know, practicing that or you go out to an incident that happens you know, 
once a year, you know, in other industries, nuclear and such, you know, maybe never, right? you better be prepared if those really bad things do happen. That's when you really run into problems because you haven't had the ability to practice those things. And so we see those, uh, those high risk, low frequency incidents sort of being an ideal fit for uh, these technologies in the sense that um, you can't necessarily, those cases that you can't do in the real world. Right. So, you know, bringing up the question of, okay, that's kind of, VR, AR is kind of cool, but what's the point? Right. And so, targeting those niche applications that you just can't do in the real world or is extremely expensive in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I'd say that sounds a lot like it's similar to the problem space we talk about, where the important thing is that it's a very quick and natural and intuitive understanding of what you're looking at. So, you can focus on problem solving, not on understanding what you're looking at. Yeah. Right. If I can just build a little bit on that from what from our perspective, from pure maintenance, it makes it a very easy uh, entry point to the technology itself. So while uh, we see the biggest value uh, of AR VR in operations itself, uh, AR specifically in operations, but because people are risk averse and you need to prove the technology first, the first thing which, which we hear, okay, let's, let us try this with training. Uh, because uh, anywhere where you, where you don't touch in the jet, you don't putting anything at risk. Uh, makes people more comfortable in the beginning, but then if it's proven successful there, they're more comfortable in bringing it to daily life. Thank you, gentlemen. I'd like to um, invite the audience to go ahead and um, enter any questions you may have in the Q&A portion, and um, we'll be able to push those to our panelists. Um, continuing on um, the line of what you're seeing from your clients, what, what do they care about and what do they, view as valuable when they approach uh, approach you? I can build on uh, my previous story that uh, obviously safety is number one, then mission capable rates with which then uh, zooms in into specific drivers of that. So that, that are two things, uh, labor productivity and number of errors. Uh, number of errors again results in the slowing your productivity down because you cannot allow anything faulty on the flight and you return it back to, to rework. And some of the cases which we saw have potential and, and the future, it also converges uh, AR with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, is uh, when you can make a picture or, or even a video recording of a completed job, you can then analyze it uh, with AI on the back end and do a bunch of uh, useful things with it. First of all, you can uh, potentially stop technician on the spot from making a mistake. If something in a very standardized job was done improperly and the person didn't notice it because of being tired or, or just doing it a thousand times a day already and, and missing one bolt, for example, to screw it. Uh, and in the future, even if everything was done correctly now, then you can use these recordings and uh, analyze it for future incidents, uh, revision, uh, and also for training purposes. None of this is uh, leveraged today because uh, all documentation is basically paper and the, the best device which, which people have is, is your tough book or, or tablet and you are not capturing how work was done and they care about it. They want to learn from the past mistakes and having this uh, powerful analytics on the background can make their job way safer, safe uh, from our estimates from like typical 30, uh, let's say three hour, uh, three hour repair order, they can save up to 30 minutes of time by uh, not committing the mistakes and doing the rework later on. Yeah, and I think, I think that overlaps with what we've seen just to build on that is uh, AR specifically kind of has two distinct value propositions. One prop part of that proposition is the convenient wearable aspect, which is if you're wearing the display and you can see the real world and see the information and overlay, uh, there's a ton of value that comes from that, regardless of the specifics of the visuals. And then there's a sort of three-dimensional component. And so we've seen the, you know, the value proposition for those two things come up pretty regularly. Uh, and we've all, we've, I think we've seen the same interest in even in maintenance and training uh, on the, um, not only the value prop of the uh, wearable display that you can keep track of everything in real time, but also on the depth information that's, that's being conveyed. So seeing a complex, for example, doing a maintenance operation in a complex space where you have to get a part and maneuver it in around other piping or wiring, um, there's, there's, a, there's an element of that from the 3D benefits as well, which we have seen 
some interest in our displays, but I think the wearable aspect really comes through in AR for that particular use case. Spot on, Russ. I see that the, the displays which you are working on are really uh, next gen and uh, high tech and uh, would have much more capabilities than something which is around today. Please do it faster. People will use it elsewhere, not only for pilots. I, I tell our R&D team that same thing all the time. <laughs> Yeah, on our side, working with subject matter experts, getting their feedback was just essential and really going into detail, right? Uh, uh, you know, versus the first thing they respond with. So, for example, uh, we worked with firefighters, right? Sort of the, you know, the obvious thing you think about what we thought we were going to focus on is, you know, okay, let's simulate, you know, firefight, you know, fires. And, uh, you know, a lot of companies are focused on that, on that. But after really talking closely with the subject matter experts, in our case, we actually hired the subject matter experts instead of just, you know, talking with them to, you know, part time to really, you know, work with them on creating things. But one of our subject matter experts, one of our firefighters told us, uh, he said, come on, you know, you're going to simulate fire in VR, you know, I know you can make it look cool and all that, but come on, I'm not afraid of fires, right? I'd like physically fighting fires, all, maybe not every day, but quite a bit. And so that ended up not being the use case we went with because of that feedback. We went with hazardous material detection because there's some things that you just can't you know, they one, they don't practice it as often and they just can't do the way they do training is, you know, there's a lot of unknowns and such that you could visualize with the technologies that, you know, they kind of are already able to do with training with uh, firefighting. Um, some of you have mentioned um, that um, a barrier and challenge is uh, people being risk averse. What other um, kinds of uh, barriers have you faced in dealing with clients and um, extended reality products? I can mention a few. Uh, number one thing, unfortunately, is hardware. Uh, I'm saying unfortunately because in our specific case, we don't deal with, with it. We're only software uh, developer and this is out of our control, but this is the first thing which the client sees. They think that we are developing the glasses and they're saying, oh, it's not that convenient as we, with, as we expected. Luckily, it's changing. So uh, we, we do have products coming out from, from different big names and uh, we're expecting more, more of that to come. But this is the first most noticeable thing, unfortunately. Uh, and number two, I would say that integration with data sources. So uh, everybody is wary about, uh, of, of their privacy and security of the data. Uh, and I'm glad to be hearing this because it's not that of an issue in fact uh, with the development the, uh, as much as they think. Of course, you need to have all the access to, to the data uh, and to your platforms and uh, also to re like rewrite the data, uh, not only display the data from your systems, but also creating your discrepancy reports and feeding back to the system. So it has to be fully integrated with these XR inter interfaces. But luckily for the development stage, you can work with dummy data. And this is what we're trying to convince everybody that we just need somebody seemingly looking like, look, looking like your uh, forms and documents and when it is developed you can fully control it and it will not be cloud-based so everybody is asking is it on the on the somebody's server or on our local server so the second challenge is, is data uh, transfer and I, i'm very convinced that uh, it's it's not an issue in the future thank you yeah i think i think that matches we've seen the the, the data challenge problem as well uh, battle space data is typically classified and there's a whole bunch of sensitivity around that. And our argument is always, we don't care about the actual details. Give me the video game version. That's fine. We can visualize that and you can understand what you're looking at. Um, as a hardware vendor, I, I, I agree with you on the, um, the hardware is the first thing people see. Uh, we have seen, I think AR, VR and displays all have different versions of the problem. Um, AR, you know, everyone I think agrees it will, it will take off when the glasses are comfortable and light and the power and can hold enough power to run for a long enough time to do the job. Um, and I think we'll get there. It's just, a, it's, a, it's a long process to develop hardware. I think VR has the comfort and, and uh, resistance to wearing the, the equipment problem. Um, and it's gonna be hard for VR to ever get to, you know, such a light form factor. I think that, you know, you'd hope ideally that same set of glasses gives you uh, the ability to go and be fully uh, screened off versus having the, the light coming in. Uh, but knowing what I know about the details of the technologies under the hood there, that's, that's going to be a while away. Um, 
it's one of the reasons we, we think there's a good fit in some applications for just a natural display that we're already used to using in 2D and trying to figure out um, you know, what are the key requirements that make you make that switch instead of living with what is good enough today. And we've gotten a lot of feedback on what those answers are. And again, they, they come back to what Jason said, which is high consequence things that are very difficult to do with existing technologies. Yeah, there's all sorts of challenges, I'm sure, you know, a lot, all of you guys are aware, with, aware of. But I'd say maybe the, the top three for us is, one is it's, uh, you know, so quality problem. It's, it's pretty easy now to put together something or use existing content to totally wow something, you know, that first two minutes of, wow, this is amazing. So that's a great thing, but it also creates challenges. Uh, it gets their mind going, of, oh, wow, you know, can you do this? And suddenly their mind is opened up and then they're like, okay, can you, this is amazing, can you do this? And, you know, can you have it next week? <laughs> right. right. And so there's, uh, you know, managing expectations, right? Because a lot of times we get people coming with use cases that it seems kind of interesting, but the technology maybe just isn't ready for that use case yet. And so we sort of have to manage those expectations. Another thing is, you know, sometimes when you deliver these systems, people get really excited about it. And after two months, it's, you know, sitting empty because people don't necessarily know how to turn it on and stuff. So I think providing companies are providing that support, uh, you know, instead of just trying to sell a product and saying, okay, you know, we'll move on to the next customer. And then um, maybe the, the elephant in the room over the last six months is the coronavirus. So, you know, we shut down all demos, we've shut down um, user studies, right? We've had a, you know, request no cost extensions and such on contracts. And so we've been thinking a lot about that, of putting together protocols so that when we do open back up, of, uh, you know, desanitizing equipment and, uh, you know, making sure everyone's safe. And so, uh, you know, not, they're still working towards some of those things, but uh, certainly challenges we'll have to work, we'll have to all work towards. How yeah, much hardware in your case, uh, Jason? No, sorry, Ginger. I'm sorry. Uh, just, just curious, uh, how about hardware story in your case, Jason? Do you face any challenges with that? Uh, I hope to hear a positive answer, at least from, from someone. Yeah, ours is uh, tracking quality uh, for specific technicalities, right? So you get a lot of vendors that claim sub-millimeter, uh, precision or sub millimeter accuracy. And uh, there's a difference between, you know, technically there's a difference of precision and accuracy. And I haven't seen any system come close to, you know, actually their claims of sub millimeter accuracy. So that's sort of on the technical side of, uh, you know, there's a ways to go, especially when you start doing physical interactions of physical props and such. For us, that's one of the problems we're taking on trying to solve, of, uh, you know, how can we work around those inaccuracies? major challenge for in our specific case. Yeah, and I think I think there's a broader one. It, all the wearables always face the, what I'm just gonna put into the very broad category of ergonomics, but um, it, it's both a you know a comfort thing, but also a usage over time thing, very similar to what you described about people will use it and be very impressed. Uh, but that's not the same as I have to wear this all day and it needs to be comfortable enough. And that's up to the hardware vendors to solve because it, it uh, there's both a comfort level and then there's actually a physiological problem with the way that we do 3D today with one flat image per eye. Um, your your visual system is actually doing work there and knows it. And some people get problems like they get nauseous. Other people is just fatigue. Um, all those problems, as long as they're still there, it's going to make it hard to use these things like all day, every day, as opposed to in bursts. And I think that's that's an ongoing challenge that um, is getting better over time, but is is a tough one. Thank you. Jason, um, to, to build off of what you said about managing expectations as a barrier, we're beginning to get some questions in from our audience. And someone asks, um, what are your thoughts on using current technology as a stand-in for emerging over the next five to 10 years, emerging tech to test concepts now to ac accelerate later fielding? Maybe, maybe yeah. I, can I lead on that one? Sure, <laughs> right? go ahead. Anyway. Given that I'm doing a technology that won't really emerge for five to 10 years, that's, uh, that is our whole, you know, that's a strategy we are forced to take and it's actually quite effective. Um, we haven't done a ton of it yet in the field in terms of using say VR uh, as a stand in to understand what a holographic display experience is going to be like as the technology improved, but we did it uh, in the early days and, it, and I think it is a great opportunity um, on all through all of the fronts that are out there, you know, using VR now, assuming it will get better, uh, is, is a fairly easy thing for a user to imagine. 
Uh, same thing goes for AR. And for us, it's critical to, to be able to use that existing tech, not only the visual piece, but also all the technologies that are being developed for VR and AR, the track, the gesture tracking, voice commands, um, we piggyback all that stuff. So I think it's it's critical to do that, is use the, yeah. use the tech today uh, to, to ease people into what's coming. Yeah, essentially that's exactly what, what we're doing with uh, NIST National Institute of Standards and Technology is prototyping future technologies using virtual reality. As one example of that is, uh, you know, augmented reality sort of has a different challenges, in some cases, you know, tougher challenges. And so we, you know, we simulate, to get, kind of get meta on, on everyone, we simulate uh, augmented reality with virtual reality to kind of figure out, you know, what are the challenges that, you know, field of view is, you know, one example of, uh, okay, what if we had a wide, how important is field of view for specific use cases? And other examples, we uh, one example is we uh, we created a armband interface, right? A physical device that goes on your arm so you don't have to hold controllers, right? So I'm typing on a keyboard or whatever, I don't have to pick up the controller, et cetera. Or if you're out in the field, maybe it's important you have your hands free, but you want to be able to interact with it. So we're doing that in VR, but the ultimate product, right? If that goes somewhere, this is, you know, research at this stage, but if that goes somewhere, it might have nothing to do with augmented reality or virtual reality. It might be, you know, prototyping that product that maybe emerges further out for real world use. Right, it's put on. That allows us to, you know, quickly iterate and try different conditions, put you in, you know, the crazy uh, dangerous environment, actually tested in that environment versus, you know, just in the lab that, you know, is typically done with only testing. Yeah, for sure. We do the same thing with field of view uh, on light field displays, figuring out what that's like in the environment before you build it. Um, we are getting more and more questions in. Um, Constantine, did you want to add on to this? Just a quick one. Uh, I think an example of reverse innovation, if we can, I can call it, uh, I see how AR can bridge, can, can become a bridge in just uh, reimagining the existing workflows, not inventing entirely new technologies, as gentlemen has, have commented, but very, uh, it turns out that maintenance workflow is very complex and sometimes inefficient. If we go through this path of uh, implementing AR, we can then maybe potentially extract AR from it, but the workflow itself will become simpler. Thank you. Um, someone has asked about um, how your products can benefit from um, artificial intelligence. That's infinite field. I'll be very quick uh, just to save more <laughs> uh, time, but uh, as I said, image recognition and, uh, and image analysis uh, of the completed work, uh, and uh, that's a major one. Yeah, so it, it has just many ramifications, but I'll stop here, this one conceptual. Probably too big to, to delve into yeah. in this panel. We have um, about two minutes left, and there's some um, comments here about latency, and um, uh, can anybody talk a little bit about um, the latency between servers and actors, Jason? Well, so I did my PhD on latency and perception of latency. So uh, be careful when you ask that question. You may not get me to stop. But uh, yeah, there's lots of challenges with latency and there's not a single number, right? It depends what you're doing. We found the biggest factor is the individual, the person, not necessarily the technology. And so uh, one of our, one of my um, participants in a study, right, couldn't notice latency at 300 milliseconds in a head-mounted display, right? Another subject could notice, you know, differences at 3.2 milliseconds. And so there's a huge range of requirements. There's also different types of latency, right? You can actually get away with quite a bit of, um, of latency, certain types of latency that, you know, right, like watching a video, it can be delayed by two days, right? That's two days of latency, but it's still can be valuable. I think another example of that is I know the, um, the F-35 uh, fighter jet, as far as their uh, heads up display, there were major challenges of latency, of, you know, because putting all those systems together, integrating everything together, it's not just a sim simple matter of, you know, adding together the individual components, but how they're integrated together can be a huge challenge. So uh, yeah, no, there's certainly been uh, challenges on the with one minute left, um, we um, are getting some comments about um, VR devices that have components that are not made in the US. Um, do you guys have any um, information that you could provide about US manufacturers or how you guys deal with um, things like this when you're dealing with networked classified um, materials and 
products. Uh, I'll speak briefly before you, these, uh, I don't know as much about the VR hardware. I can okay. say that at least for the new technologies that we're developing, we have full control uh, over the manufacturing process. So we are already uh, gearing up so that we will be in a position to make, uh, let's call it NATO only supplier chain uh, based versions of these displays. Um, that's, we're not there yet because we're still in the prototyping stage, but uh, that, that is part of our plan specifically for this reason. Great. We are relying on US based, uh, US based companies, which we believe should solve this problem for us. Uh, we, we need good hardware to build the ecosystem for it. Wonderful. I'd like to thank all of my panelists. We are out of time, unfortunately. Um, on your screen, you can see the contact information for everyone. And I will also um, go ahead and put that into the chat. Um, again, thank you everyone for um, your participation today.